Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. This week my guest is Beryl Johnson. She tells me what it was like sharing the stage with many great comedians, how she met the impresario Dougie Chapman, and I find out who was really the boss. So please, sit back and enjoy the latest Panto Podcast. My guest for today's Panto Podcast is Beryl Johnson. Hello, Beryl. Hello, Hayden. It's as if we've just met. <laughs> and we've been chatting away for ages. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, it's lovely to meet you anyway. Lovely and to meet you too. Thank you for coming to see me. And as I said to you earlier, since you rang me a couple of weeks ago uh, to, to ask me to do this, uh, I've been rooting through all, all sorts of things and I'd forgotten quite a lot of my life story myself going back uh, so many years so so it's been a, a revelation for me to uh, to you know readjust to to my life story so basically I was born in in Yorkshire South Yorkshire my dad was a miner and um, uh, my mum was just a housekeeper and did odd jobs in the day at various places but they um, I went to secondary modern school uh, and uh, uh, took an interest in singing and the teachers there encouraged me and I think of really initially I was thinking of perhaps being a music teacher but as the time progressed um, they thought oh I think she could be a performer because whenever there was anything going on at the school I was the first up you know to uh, to show off and sing or whatever so uh, so it progressed from going into the teaching side of it to the performing side of it I think that's how it all happened so from secondary modern school, um, I won a scholarship to go to the Huddersfield College of Technology uh, into the music department uh, to uh, train classically, uh, piano and singing, but I could never really take to piano. Uh, it, I wasn't quick enough at piano, whereas singing, I just had to open my mouth and it was there. So, um, so I did a four-year course at the uh, Huddersfield College of Music um, techno technology college it should be shouldn't it music department which I thoroughly enjoyed and took part in in lots of things there the choirs the choral concerts trained in for oratorio and and all that and and again a great encouragement from people so I think my parents thought well yeah she might be onto something here although they didn't have the money to pay for any training so I always had to get a scholarship or some money of some sort which I managed to do so from Huddersfield, then, uh, after four years there, um, I gained a, a course at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. Uh, again, it was a three-year AGSM course and then a, a one-year advanced course in uh, advanced singing, which again was great, great grounding and uh, took part in all the opera, opera productions and had some, had some great, great classically, you know, backgrounds. And while I was there, I always thought my first pantomime was later than this, but again, going back to my records, I discovered I actually did a pantomime when I was in London, which would be about, oh, when was that? Uh, da, 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 19, uh, late 60s, 70s. And I remember now going to audition for Cyril Fletcher. Do you remember Cyril Fletcher? I'm just thinking of the chair, yeah. Yeah, Cyril <laughs> Fletcher. And he was uh, uh, involved in the um, Everyman Theatre at Cheltenham. And he was producing the pantomime then. I think it was Dick Whittington. And I went to audition him to him and got the part of Alice in this pantomime, Alice Fitzwarren. And from what I can remember vaguely about it, uh, he was in it. I can't remember who else was in it, to be honest with you. Uh, but I think that was my very first pantomime. Uh, and that was while I was still down in London. So I must have seen that the auditions were uh, down there. So so that's how I came to do that. So as I say, um, yeah, so um, so from, uh, from then leaving the Guildhall, um, I came back north um, to live in the Manchester area. And uh, I sang, began to sing with the Manchester BBC Symphony Orchestra and Chorus, which was a great thing. Um, lovely, classically, you know, classical songs and great conductors and things. 
And I also sang with with a little uh, group, like a little, what was called a madrigal group, which would today be like a girl band, I suppose you'd class it as now, about eight or 16 of us, which was close harmony. And I remember sing, doing something like that as well at this time. But obviously singing with the BBC Northern Symphony Orchestra and Chorus was great. Uh, and, and I loved it. And then I... I also remember at that period I did pantomimes for a guy called Nelson Firth Senior. I don't know if you ever heard of Nelson Firth no, Senior. Well, he was a pantomime promoter in the 60s and 70s and there was, there was he and his son, they were both called Nelson Firth. So we had to call Nelson Firth Senior and Nelson Firth mm. Junior. And Nelson Firth Senior, I remember it was when I was living in Didsbury and uh, I somehow got hold of this name and I went to audition for Nelson Firth Senior at his uh, uh, home in Didsbury. And uh, I went to do a pantomime for him at the Lancastrian Hall at Swinton. And the subject was um, Babes in the Wood. And I played Maid Marion. And uh, starring the headliner was Charlie Williams. And it was the first pantomime that Charlie Williams had done. And I think he went into this pantomime, not as a name, but when he came out of the pantomime, of course, he'd been in the golden shot, hmm. right? So when he came out of the pantomime, he was the big star from golden shot, which bless him. I mean, I loved him to bits and he was a Yorkshireman like myself. Uh, we got on really well, uh, but I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this now, although I know he's not here, but he wasn't it wasn't the thing for him to do the golden shot he he didn't do it he was mm. lost in it really but he was a lovely lovely man and in this pantomime babes in the wood as i say he was headliner and he played the good robber i remember so there's a bad robber and a good robber and he played the good robber which was great for him because he got all the kids on his side you know and when the bad robber said something evil and Charlie said, nah, you can't, you know, you know, you can't do that, you know, in, mm. in this Yorkshire. And all the kids said, hey, <laughs> you know. Um, I remember that so well. Um, so I think that was the second pantomime, professional pantomime, after uh, Cyril Fletcher, which is one I'd forgotten. Um, so that was for Nelson Firth Senior. Then I did another one for Nelson Firth Senior. Uh, the year after, so I, I'm not sure what the year was of the Lancastrian Hall um, one. Um, about seven, early 70s it would be, I think. And the year after, Nelson asked me to go into um, Dick Whittington, which was at the Forum at Romilly, which is in the Manchester area. And again, I played, I think I played Alice in that as well, and that, the headliner there, was Charles Hawtrey. Goodness, remember from the Carry yes. On films? Now, I don't remember much about him. He played the comic, you know, the Idle Jack. Mm. And I, I seem to remember he kept himself very much to himself. But he was the headliner. And I think the dame at that time in that pantomime was George Raymond, who was very well established as a pantomime dame. Very good. And... Um, I'm not sure how long these pantomimes ran, but in those days the pantomimes ran a good length, five or six weeks at a time, mm -hmm. you know. They're not like that anymore, they're pretty short in comparison, really. But that that was good, I enjoyed that. So they were both sort of my second and third pantomimes there. Were they hard work? All, I think all pantomimes are hard work, you know, particularly if you're doing two a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with costume changes and things. So yeah, I mean, they're enjoyable, but they are hard work, particularly for a pantomime dame with all the costume changes, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think people think, oh, it, you know, they're on the stage and they're having a laugh, but there is the element of hard work to it, or every time, but it is still great fun. <laughs> Um, so yeah, oh, and also in that pantomime that Charlie Williams was in, um, I'll tell you who was in it. Do you remember, did you ever know a man called Roy Lance? He used to do, yes, he, he used to write a lot of scripts for pantomimes and he was a great friend of Dougie's. He was also a, a cartoonist. He, he do, did 
characterizations and things great things and he was the muddle he was the you know the comic the muddles thing mm. character in that um he was very nice nice man again no longer with us um so then after that i didn't do a pantomime but i did join a group an operatic group called yorkshire opera uh, which again i auditioned for and got the part of michaela in carmen and that did a little tour of uh, towns in the yorkshire area todmud you know to is todmud in yorkshire i'm not sure if it's in yorkshire or lancashire but anyway it was a little tour of all the um all the little um, villages and towns in the Yorkshire area, which I think ran about three weeks. I think we just did a couple of days at each place. But that was very nice. I enjoyed that. There were no star names in that. It was just very good artists in it. Uh, and I enjoyed playing the part of, of Carmen in that. Um, so that's really where the pantomime then stopped a bit. But I did, I did do other shows... Uh, and again, still singing with the BBC Northern Singers. And then, of course, in 1973, I met Dougie, Dougie Chapman, who I'd known about because coming from Yorkshire and living uh, near Barnsley, I'd heard of him because he did all, uh, many years at the Barnsley Civic Theatre with pantomimes. But I didn't meet him there. I met him in Bridlington. Um, he was doing his show at the Spa Theatre there, and I was there, I think I was singing with, um, what's it called? Uh, not not uh, Max Jaffa, the other guy who used, Max Jaffa was at Scarborough, I think, but this other guy, Edwin Harper. And uh, there was a big glass building on the promenade area, Bridlington, you know, where they grow flowers, uh, almost like a greenhouse thing. Mm. Uh, and they did like palm court orchestras where all the old ladies used to sit and have the, do the knitting and stuff like that, you know. And this, this person, Edwin Harper, had his little afternoon sessions there. And I think I, I somehow, I can't remember how, got into doing that. And while doing that, I found out that this Dougie Chapman was putting his variety show on at the Spa um, Theatre in Bridlington. So I went along and just said, could I audition for Dougie Chapman? And... He got back to me and said yes, so I went along, and that was the first time I actually met him, but having heard of him. And that's when, um, as I say, I met Dougie, and from then on I did all his pantomimes, uh, and he, he did the Barnsley Civic Theatre successively year after year after year. But the first one I did for him was that year, that 1973, that Christmas, and I remember him saying to me, it's Jack and the Beanstalk and I have cast it uh, and the only part I've got left is playing fairy. And of course I said, well, I don't mind playing fairy, I'll, I'll play fairy. And in it was uh, Ken Platt was headlining as Kenny Cucumber. That was always Ken Platt's title, Kenny Cucumber. And the dame was Jack Story, who again was a very well-established uh, pantomime dame. And um, people you probably wouldn't know, but Angie Dean and Colin Robbins, who were local pe local professionals, who were fabulous. She was a fabulous principal boy. And Colin was a, a great comic. He played Comedy King, I, th I seem to remember. And so I was fairy in this production of Jack and the Beanstalk. And we did nine weeks. Nine weeks. And at that time, I, I, I lived with my mum and dad in Yorkshire, um, in, in the, the little village where we lived. Um, and I travelled into Barnsley to do the pantomime, and it was nine weeks run. Can you can you imagine nine weeks run? So that that was hard work, really, mm. but most enjoyable. I mean, it was really good, and and everyone in it was absolutely lovely. So that that was that, and then from then on, I carried on working for Dougie, and I went to do my first summer season for him at the uh, Embassy Theatre Skegness. That was when it was the old Embassy Theatre. It's now a brand new complex. Uh, well, I'm saying now, recently, about five, six years ago, I guess it would have, you know, it was developed into a, a more modern building. But at that time, it, it was the old Embassy. And um, I did my first summer season for Dougie there in a good old days show. 
again, which was great. No headliners as such, just very good artists and did great business and, and I loved it. Um, so that was that. And then that following year, so this is my second year uh, in consecutive, um, I, I did um, the pantomime at Barnsley again at the Civic and I, I was uh, title role in Cinderella. And the headliner then was Danny Ross. Do you remember Danny Ross? No, I don't. A little bit like a Jimmy Jimmy Clitheroe character was Danny Ross. Um, so he was headlining then as Buttons to my Cinderella. And uh, again, it was a long run. I remember it must have been eight or nine weeks. And, and great business. Dougie always seemed to get good audiences there all the time. Um, and that was a lovely pantomime, Cinderella. Um, yeah, I loved I loved that. Um, then from there, carrying on working for Dougie, I went to do a summer season at the Victoria Pavilion at Ilfracombe. This was about 1975. And uh, again, it was a good old days show. Again, no star names, just good jobbing uh, entertainers. But I tell you, there was a very funny couple in this particular show. Um, the lady, the, the, the it was a man and, and wife situation, and the lady was called Lindy McNaughton, I think she was called, and she was a big lady, a big lady, and she did like male impersonator spots, but she I always remember she did this spot dressed as a sailor, and as I say, she was a big lady, but she had all the sailor stuff on, and it was smoked a pipe. <laughs> And she did all the all the uh, seafaring ditties, but her husband, who played for the show on the piano, not on the keyboard, I think it was piano. He, um, Lindy McNaughton, and what was he called? I can't remember his name. But he wrote the song. You probably remember "Little Brown Monkey," "Little Brown Monkey, 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 Little Brown Monkey." It was quite a well-known song mm. at the time, and he wrote that. And they were husband and wife. But she was a real character. I mean, uh, she really was. I, I can remember the, her dress with smoking this pipe and doing this act on the stage. Amazing. Wouldn't get that now, would you? You wouldn't. <laughs> Health and safety, no way, no way. Things have changed an awful lot. Um, yes, yeah, so that was uh, at the Pavilion Theatre at Ilfracombe, which again was a lovely season. I loved it. So then that Christmas, now, uh, the, the next year, this is my third year at Barnsley Civic for Dougie, um, I played, uh, it was Aladdin, and I played Princess Lotus Blossom in that to Bobby Crush playing my Aladdin. And Bobby was lovely, and it was early days uh, for Bobby, because uh, I, 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 was, I was ribbing him not very long ago, because he had long hair, he was, he was, you know, thin very thin, long hair, and at that time his dad was with him, his dad used to drive him around, and he, he was lovely, and so I, I do rib him now, because obviously he's spread out a bit, but still very talented man, but we had a great season there, and he played Aladdin, I played Princess, and um, I can't remember, I can't remember who else was in it, now at one time there was, um, da, 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 but I think that's a bit later on, um, Tony Piers, you know the entertainment, the promoter Tony mm. Piers, he was in a production of Aladdin playing Chinese policeman, but I think we did another production of Aladdin a bit later on and I'm not quite sure whether Tony was in that production or the later one, but I'll see if I can find that out as we go along. So that was Aladdin at Barnsley. So then that following summer season, again for Dougie, I went into the variety show Good Old Days at the Galston, P Theater, Galston Pavilion Theatre at um, Galston, just outside Great Yarmouth. Mm. And that was a production of Good Old Days, again. Um, great business, lovely little theatre, really nice little theatre. And coaches used to bring everyone in from Great Yarmouth itself, you know. Uh, great business. And yes, that, that was a very nice season too. Um, again for Dougie and then the following year again for Dougie pantomime 
1976, I did the uh, Charter Theatre Preston. Uh, again, it was Aladdin, the subject, and I, again, I played Princess. And topping the bill at the time as Wishy Washy was Frank Carson. Goodness. <laughs> now, Frank Carson, lovely, lovely man. I loved him to bits, but, oh, he was a nightmare. You never knew if he was going to be there. He didn't know any of his lines, so he sort of made them up as he went along. So nobody got a, a cue at all. But you, you just loved him to bits. Uh, and as I say, nine times out of ten, he wouldn't be there for his cue. He'd be on the telephone or, or something. Uh, but he, he was lovely. Yeah, that was at the Charter Theatre. Um, when the Charter Theatre used to do a great business, um, it, it's not done as well lately. It is in a bit of a funny position is the Charter Theatre. It's sort of above a shopping precinct and it wasn't always easy to access. But we did great business with it, I remember. And I also remember the dressing rooms were a nightmare. They were down on the ground floor level and to get to the stage was up about three flights of stairs. You know, uh, fortunately there was a corridor at the back so if you knew you weren't going to be long before doing your next entrance, you could sit and wait. But it was a bit of a nightmare for, for the dame, uh, for costume changes and stuff like that. I can't remember who the dame was uh, at that time. But Frank, as I say, was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. oh, I know it was dame. Roy Barraclough. Do you remember Roy? Yes. Yeah, and he, he was dame and he was lovely. Uh, and of course, then he went into Coronation Street, Coronation didn't he? Street. Yeah, and yeah. Cisionators. That's yes. right, with Les, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Roy was lovely as well, and of course, the Dame and Wishy Washy worked quite a lot together. And he, 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 <laughs> Roy used to tear his hair out. But yeah, that so that was that pantomime. Now, at the end of that pantomime season, Frank Carson got me a job on a cruise ship. Somebody he knew was looking for a headliner on on a cruise ship going uh, sailing out from um, Singapore and I I remember as soon as we'd finished the pantomime which would be early January you know about two or three weeks into January I remember getting ready to go to fly out from uh, London from Heathrow to Singapore to join this ship which was called the Rasa Sayang lovely ship and uh, we sailed all around the uh, Malaysian and Indonesian islands, which which was lovely, as you can imagine. And I did three months on that, so it was like the end of January, February, March into April. And I I was headlining there, um, you know, doing my own bits, um, mostly to Americans. Um, and there were a lot of Chinese on the ship as well because the Chinese love to gamble, so the ship would often sail out of Singapore or Bali or in um, Jakarta or anywhere like that, anchor up just for the Chinese to gamble. As long as they were out of the zone, you know, it, they could gamble. And so we often just used to sit there for two or three nights while the Chinese gambled. But a, a lot of them were Americans on the ship cruising around for holidays. And again, that was a great experience, loved it. So I came back from that three months on the, on the Rasa Sayang and I went straight into a summer season for Dougie uh, at the Opera House Scarborough starring David Whitfield and Charlie Williams, the Charlie Williams Laughter Show. And uh, that was when it was privately owned by a guy called Don Robinson, I think he was called. I think that's the right name. And it was privately owned, as I say, and um, it was a lovely season. David was lovely although he, he did have a problem uh, drinking, I'm afraid. Uh, Charlie again was lovely. And um, yeah, very happy memories of David, but as I say, he, he, um, he very sad, because he, he just couldn't control his drinking, I'm afraid. But that, that was nice, uh, so I enjoyed that. So then, uh, what year was that? Let me look. I think that was about 1977. So then, uh, in between all these bits, Hayden, we, we always did little music hall shows uh, for either five days or a week, like at Scunthorpe Civic, 
Rotherham Civic, uh, all over the place. So in between all these, there were all the other little shows that we did, good old days mainly, at that time. But then, I'm jumping to 1981, here in Blackpool, Dougie had heard of um, a room which was available, which was above Yates's Wine Lodge, which is opposite the North Pier th there. And um, I think it used to be the bar of a theatre or, or something there. The, the Tivoli Theatre was there. I think this this room, which was on the first floor, Yates's, um, Yates's Bars was on the ground floor. And I remember downstairs below that, there was a very nice restaurant that Dougie and I used to go to called Carriages. So Carriages was below. Then Yates's Wine Lodge, where all, all the pros used to meet and have a to meet up and have a drink and there was sawdust on the floor and you know it was rough and ready but everyone met there but then this room was the next floor up and um, it was just a, a an empty room with a pile of rubble in the middle but for however it came about I don't know but Dougie took it on and we recreated it as the music hall tavern and we had a little corner stage put in and a backdrop painted, although you couldn't get behind it, it was a brick wall. Mm. So access had to be made from either side, up treads at either side. But we ran that as the Music Hall Tavern and it was terrific. And what we did, um, when the artist, in the days when Blackpool had lots of shows and there were lots of artists here like Barbara Windsor, Trevor Bannister were hearing plays, you know, all the peers had shows. So what we used to do, we used to in invite the artist to the music hall tavern at lunchtime to have a drink or whatever, and I'd do big trays of sandwiches. Well, of course, that used to uh, encourage lo uh, tourists to come meet the stars. Mm -hmm. We could sell drinks, and, and it was a really nice atmosphere, and we decorated the room up with all the memorabilia and stuff like that. Great times, but unfortunately, we, we found that we couldn't we couldn't be there all the time, Dougie and I. Um, we had other things to do. And so it lasted, I think it, I think we ran it for about four or five years and then we said, we'll have to let it go. And, and a friend who who did, uh, who did worked there, a, a girl who sang, she took it over with her husband and carried on with it successfully for some years after, I believe. But at the time it was great. Um, it was it was really good and we got some great great stars Les Dawson used to come up and you know all, all those sort of people who were doing shows in town at the minute sadly it's not like that now so that was the music hall tavern then I was asked to go to do a, a summer season for Butlins uh, this was 1982 and I went to Butlins Patheli to do the summer season there um, which was great experience. I loved it. Uh, I was there for several months, and the headline of the comic in the show it was just a variety show. We did several productions, you know, different different shows per night and stuff like that. But the the comic in it was Kenny Cantor. Do you remember Kenny? Yes, Kenny, who sadly passed away with the glasses, times, with the big gla coloured glasses, mm. who again Dougie had known for years and years and years, and was a water rat and uh, we'd known him a long time and uh, I think it must have been Kenny who recommended me to the guy who was putting the show on whose name I can't think who it was now but um, Kenny was lovely and as I say it was great experience because we did several shows uh, each week for the you know we, we were the resident shows and um, I loved it uh, and that was at Patheli. Um then I came back to Barnsley Civic, into pantomime, would you believe, for Dougie. Um, pantomime, uh, again, it was Cinderella, and I was the title role. And the comic then, playing buttons, was Lee Clark. I don't know if you've heard of Lee Clark. Lee was a very good, or I mean, he's still around. I'm not quite sure where he's based, but um, I know he commented something on my Facebook page not very long ago, which was nice. I think I must have put the... Um, the poster on with his name on uh, Lee Clark was great comic and the lovely buttons very sympathetic and that the ugly sisters then were Burden and Moran do you ever remember yes, Burden and Moran, Moran Morris and Roger 
Um, very funny. I mean, Morris was just hilarious. Uh, he sadly passed away. I think Roger, who is now called Ch Charles Burden, I think he's still. I think he's still around and lives on the Isle of Wight. But a lovely act. I loved them both to bits. Funny, funny, ugly sisters. But Morris just used to send it up. I mean, it was just. I mean, Charles was all. Roger was the glamour, you know. But Charles, Morris just used to send it up. Funny, funny, ugly sisters. Um, but Lee was very good as Buttons, and again, it was a lovely season. Pantomime season. And from there. I went to do a summer season, 1983, to Newquay, to the Newquay Theatre, to do a summer season for a guy called Don Rivers, who again was someone Dougie knew. Baritone, beautiful baritone singer and a big, big stature of a man, you know, who had great, great presence. And he and his wife ran the Newquay Theatre. Now, there were two theatres in Newquay. There was the Cozy Nook, which was down by the seashore. And there was the New Key Theatre, which was up on the hill. And that's where I, I did the summer season. Again, it was a, a old time music hall. And uh, he'd got Ken Platt starring in it, who of course I knew from pantomimes and uh, through Dougie for, for some years prior to this. And we had a very successful season there doing, uh, I think we did two programmes a week at New Key Theatre and um, just a variety show, as I say, with Ken headlining it. And I think at that time, Frank Carson was down at the Cozy Nook uh, doing the show there, because I seem to remember meeting up with him through knowing him through at the pantomime, you know. And I seem to think um, he was at the Cozy Nook at that same time in a, another show. Then, 1983, pantomime, again, for Dougie at the Charter Theatre Preston, again, uh, playing the role of Cinderella with Stu Francis as Buttons. Now, Stu, again, you know, we've known for years, and as a lovely, lovely man, and again, a fabulous Buttons, a fabulous pantomime entertainer all round. Uh, I mean, you'll remember him from Cracker Jack. I he's mean, been a guest. He's oh. been a guest, well, there you are. <laughs> uh, lovely man, great friend, he and his wife. Uh, Wendy, um, great with kids, absolutely the best with kids. Uh, he's a kid himself. I mean, even now, he, he doesn't look anything like he's it. He just looks like he was when he played buttons for me, you know, um, with me. Um, great with kids, a very good pantomime, very well established pantomime entertainer, uh, who I, I'm, I still am in touch with. So that was uh, Stu. Um, at the, I can't remember who else was in that pantomime but it was Cinderella and I was playing title role then after that Dougie knew someone who used to be uh, in business in England and, and he and his wife had moved out to Connecticut I think this man was something to do with a toy firm factory or something and he took the toy factory out to Connecticut. I know it was some connection Dougie had. Anyway, this man and his wife, who he was called Bob, this guy, he and his wife opened a, a beautiful inn, a country inn in Connecticut, a place called Reading Ridge, which like was about an hour's drive from New York. And Bob had been in touch with Dougie and he'd thought of having a, a British music hall company uh, doing the, for the Brits who had expats out there and uh, he asked Dougie to go out as chairman and do this show which was a lunchtime thing but it was um, I didn't go the first time Dougie went on his own the first time but picked up some entertainers who were expats uh, and a couple of Americans and basically it was a room and they brought these oldies in in coach parties after coach party and it was a, just a corner stage with a piano and there were trestle tables and all these oldies sat at the tables and it was the luncheon was uh, served in tiers so they had an on an entree and then they had a set of entertainment right like a sing-along mm. or whatever and then they'd have their well they called it a course it was a salad because the americans always loved a mm. salad so it was a salad and bread rolls and then there was another type of entertainment 
and then they'd have their main course and then there's another so it was like that the, the, the entertainment was intermittent to the courses of food and I remember uh, so that Dougie went out himself as chairman to, to establish it but then I went out the second year with him and we took a couple of Brits with us from here um, and that was as I say at the spinning wheel inn it was called Connecticut Reading Ridge Connecticut and uh, it, it was lovely and the Brits they loved it I mean they loved the show because we took all the costumes out there and uh, and at that time also Bob hired a car for Dougie because he had other inns in different places and I remember he had an inn at Lennox in Massachusetts and he just said to Dougie here's the keys take him to Massachusetts sort of thing you know and Dougie got in the car and we all piled in and off we went to Massachusetts to, to Le Lennox and we did the same sort of thing there as we were doing at uh, at Reading Ridge and at Reading Ridge we had a, he had a cottage within the grounds the, it was a massive massive grounds and um, this place had different rooms so people could come just to eat uh, if they didn't want the show they could just eat and stuff like that but he, this Bob had built up a, a wonderful thing here he'd, he'd finished with a toy industry and they also did weddings here as well, which was a big thing that uh, Bob's wife uh, did. Maggie, I think she was called. And uh, anyway, so and in, within these grounds, they had a, a, a separate cottage, which is where Dougie and I and, and the other two that we took with us uh, lived. And when we weren't doing the show, we just got in the car and went out to various places, got on the Amtraks to New York, uh, you know, did all, all the touristy things that you do, which, which was great. We did three years of this. Three years I went out to Connecticut to do British Hall Theatre Banquets. After, then somewhere in between that, you'll have heard of a great pantomime promoter, a legend, Aubrey Phillips. What a character. I mean, we don't have these sort of characters anymore. Aubrey and people like that, you know, it's... Aubrey was a one-off and I remember um, again he Dougie and Dougie knew all these people you see and they were friends and um, Aubrey asked Dougie if I, if I would do a pantomime for him and um, I forget what the first one was I think the first one we did was Snow White and it was a little touring pantomime um, and I was Snow White. I think Mervyn was in the pantomime as... Uh, um, was, he wasn't the comic. Uh, he'd, be, uh, he'd, be the cha he'd be the Chamberlain in Snow White. I was Snow White. And the dame, I think, was Johnny Dallas. Do you remember Johnny Dallas? Oh, no, I don't. Right, well, Dor Do uh, Johnny Dallas was a comedian, but he was also a, a, an agent for uh, actors. And he was associated with Don Ross, who went back some years. And Don Ross was married to a lady called Kitty Gillow. And Kitty Gillow died. She was a musical star. And Kitty Gillow died. And then eventually Don Ross died. And I remember after Don died, I was doing a Mary Lloyd spot in the musical shows that, that we were doing. And uh, Johnny gave me a handbag that belonged to Kitty Gillow. And it was a real bashed up, hand, like a mm. crocodile skin, bashed up handbag. But she used it in her spots. So I used it in my Mary Lloyd uh, act for quite some time. But then in later years, when I there was a period when I, I, I wasn't singing. I was more promoting and helping, you know, working alongside Dougie. I gave this handbag to the Grand Order of Water Rats, uh, which they've put in their museum as belonging to Kitty Gillow but um, yeah that, that was nice and, and I did use it quite a lot um, so that was Snow White and then I seem to think the second pantomime I did for Aubrey was Dick Whittington again a little touring production and I would be Alice in that I think um, and uh, we had a, a guy, who, again, a character called James Harmon. You wouldn't have heard of Chay. No, it's a bit before your time, Hayden. <laughs> James Harmon, Thank again, you. was a, a very, very ca a character. Hmm. And uh, he was, uh, you know, 
a bit like that and uh, but a lovely lovely actor and he played the cat well you've never seen a cat played like James Harmon played a cat it was uh, it was uh, an education let's say <laughs> but again great great times I'm not sure if Mervyn was in that or not uh, but that was the second pantomime I did for Aubrey and in one of the productions I think it was this uh, uh, he booked, Aubrey booked Jackie, Jackie Palo Jr. You know the boxer, Jackie Palo? Yes. Well, his son. Mr. TV. Mr. TV. Well, Jackie Palo Jr. Uh, was huge. He, he was short, but he was very thick set. I mean, I mean, you're a big chap sitting there, but he was, you know, really thick set and his neck was out here. <laughs> and I remember, I remember this so well. We were at the... Um, Theatre Royal St Helens, I think, rehearsing the show before it opened. And I rem I got my own costumes as Alice Fitzwarren, so I was okay. But nobody else had any costumes from what I remember, particularly Jackie Palo, who it was, you know, a first pantomime for him. And I remember old Aubrey walking into the dressing room areas at one point, and under his arm he had a load of costumes rolled up under his arm, and he threw them at Jackie and said... They are. See if anything fits. Well, it, it just looked like he'd been to the local charity shop and picked up a load. And nothing fitted him, you know. So we were cutting bits out and cutting to make stuff fit for Jackie because he was such a big fella. But that was the sort of character Aubrey was. Uh, he really was a one-off. I loved him to bits. Uh, but he was... And another occasion, I, I seem to remember somebody saying he was doing a production of Mother Goose somewhere and... Um, they were rehearsing something and there was a girl sat in the audience on the front row and Aubrey said to her, who are you? And she said, oh, I'm, I'm the drummer's girlfriend. Uh, and he said, oh, are you? He said, and he looked her up and down. He said, no, you're not. You're the goose. Come over here. <laughs> and he dressed. She, was, she ended up being the goose in Mother Goose because the goose doesn't talk, hmm. you know, so they just had to direct her. But yeah, this, <laughs> who are you? I'm the drummer's girlfriend. No, you're not. You're the goose. <laughs> But this was Aubrey. This was, and Dougie sometimes did some things like this similar. I've known Dougie book two fairies for a pantomime, forget that he'd already booked one. So one would turn up and he'd say, you know, and he'd say, I'm fairy. No, I'm fairy. And he'd end up putting one in as a assistant stage manager or something. You know, he mm. would never send one away. But I, I can remember Dougie doing that on an occasion, uh, booking two fairies forgetting you'd already booked somebody. Dougie wasn't ever so good at writing things down. It was all it was all up here, but not very good at telling anyone else. Well, one of the things I've always heard about Dougie is he was always so loyal to his performers. Very loyal, very loyal. And the performers were very loyal to him, uh, right up until his death. No, he, he was very loyal. And, you know, Dougie and I had a, a, a very serious road accident. Uh, we were going to Scarborough to the Met to the uh, is it the Metropole Hotel up on the cliffs there yes. and I think it was for Tony Pierce I think po Tony had booked us in there because Tony lives in that area and uh, I can't remember what year it was Hayden but we were on our way to Scarborough to do this uh, show good old days and we had an accident car accident at Moulton which is just before you get to Scarborough and basically, it was, um, I think it was sort of five o'clock in the sort of afternoon. It was autumn time because it was beginning to be dark and um, it was raining. And we were going round a bend and a boy hit us head on coming in from the other direction on this bend. And uh, the boy ended up in a ditch in his car, nose in. And uh, we obviously were swerved, you know, to, to miss it anyway. We had this accident and all I remember is that the front of the Jag, we were in our Jag because Dougie always drove Jags, you know, with plenty at the front, thank goodness. Mm. And uh, all I could see was this steam coming out the under from under the bonnet and Dougie moaning. He was wedged in the driver's seat and I said, oh, let, we've got to get out, we've got to get out. So I tried to get into the back seat, but that was full of costumes. But at that time also... I real oh I couldn't get out of my passenger door that was it so I tried to get into the back seat which was full of costumes 
uh, which I scrambled over and I managed to open the door behind Dougie on the, at the back. But then as soon as I went to get out, I realised I'd broken my foot, my left foot. So I couldn't walk. Luckily, there was a guy behind, not far behind us who was a doctor. And he'd stopped, obviously, to help, rang for an ambulance. But at this time, all the artists in the show were passing us in cars. And, of course, the police wouldn't let anyone stop, you know. And they were all going, that's Dougie and Beryl, that's Dougie and Beryl in the, in the jack. And I think Dougie Clark, do you remember the comedian called Dougie Clark? He was in the show, I think. And he was travelling with someone else. And... Um, Basically, uh, the ambulance came, got Dougie out and got us into the ambulance and we were taken to the York Hospital and um, I'd broken my left foot and, and was pla uh, put in a plaster cast up to my knee. Dougie was in intensive care and it was touch and go with Dougie, he got internal injury injuries and uh, uh, I had to leave Dougie in hospital, I eventually came home with the plaster cast on and I had to keep going back to Dougie because we had shows on the road so I had to get permission to sign check because all Dougie kept saying was how am I going to pay the pros that's all he kept saying how am I going to pay him because he always paid his artists on the night that they nobody ever had to wait for their money ever hmm. and he kept saying how am I going to pay him how am I go and I kept saying don't worry about it we'll do it don't worry about it and so they managed to do the show, I think. Well, they must have done, yes. They managed to do the show without me or Dougie at the hotel, made some announcement. And we were ended up in hospital, as I said. Two or three days later, I was able to come back home to Blackpool. But Dougie was in intensive care, and it was touch and go with him for quite some time. But fortunately, he came round and came home, and uh, we carried on. But, yeah, that was all we... It, how am I going to pay him? How am I going to pay him? So, yes, he was very loyal to his artists, but his artists were very loyal to him as well. I've forgotten where I'm up to now, Hayden. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so all this time I, I was working alongside Dougie, um, and when I first met him, he had pantomimes and summer shows up and down the UK. I mean, when I was in Skegness for many, several seasons at the embassy um, he'd come and visit you know and he'd come up from my, Minehead uh, he had summer shows Jersey you know Great Yarmouth as well as Galston Pavilion he had great shows on the pier both piers at Great Yarmouth Br Britannia and, and the other one um, Mablethorpe Skegness uh, all, all these resorts he had shows in and then the pantomimes as well all around the country, Scunthorpe Civic, Doncaster Civic, Barnsley Civic. Uh, seven or eight, you know, shows or pantomimes he had. And he always went to everyone, you know, he just went round them. You know, it was like a, like painting a bridge. He just kept going round and round and round. Um, and of course, in some of these shows, he had great stars as well in these uh, variety shows, Good Old Days and stuff. Uh, people like Ronnie Hilton, Ruby Murray, Clinton Ford, Billy Burden, Bob and Alf Pearson, Kevin O'Connor, and I, I used, I worked with all these people, you know, and it was just amazing, absolutely amazing, and uh, it was funny if if we were doing a show with Leslie Cerrone in it and Kevin O'Connor, they had a, it wasn't a hate hate, but they had a a thing between them and if Dougie was talking to one more than the other they got very jealous and so if if say Dougie was in Leslie Cerrone's dressing room and they were having a chat and Kevin passed by he'd come in and say what are you doing in here sort of thing you know <laughs> you know and he'd take over and they had this sort of as I say it wasn't a hate thing but they were very jealous of each other and also some of these old stars they loved their status I remember another year at, I think it was South Sea um, Theatre there, Ronnie Hilton and I think, would it have been, I think it was Ruby. I think Ruby had gone into number one dressing room and uh, when Ronnie came, he saw that she was in there and he played hello with Dougie. And uh, Dougie said, oh, I don't matter, number two's there. No, no, I knew that. 
and he actually moved Ruby out of number one into number two <laughs> and set up in there. Things like that, you know. Uh, some of these stars did have a bit of a, mm. a status symbol. But at the end of the day, they all got on and, and they, you know, but it was just an in, instinct, you know, and I'm topping the bill here or something. Oh, dear, funny. So he employed all these people. And then also when we, here in, in Blackpool, we did a wonderful se season at the Winter Gardens Pavilion uh, in the Winter Gardens Complex which is the Pavilion Theatre at the back in the Horseshoe. Hmm. Um, and we, we did two seasons there with Danny LaRue in a show called Palladium Nights. And Dougie thought of cre recreating the Tiller Girls, you know, the, the lineup of 12 girls. But we called them the new Tiller Girls. And we knew one of the old, the original Tiller Girls, should say old, should I? Uh, we, we knew one of the original Tiller Girls and um, so Dougie uh, auditioned, got uh, uh, Faye to come and audition these girls at the Winter Gardens and she chose fa uh, 10, 12 uh, fabulous girls and taught them all the Tiller's routines, the, the proper routines, mm. which we, we had to get permission to do, of course, um, from, you know, who owned the rights of the Tiller girls. And... Um, so yes, it was the Danny LaRue in Palladium Nights with the Tiller Girls um, and we had uh, the Lavelle twins who worked a lot with uh, Jimmy and... Jimmy and... I can't remember the other guy's name, the Lavelle twins. They were twins, but they worked with a lot with Danny in the show. A lady called Lizzie Wiggins, uh, who was called the Duchess of Dudley, who was a bit like a female Les Dawson. Very funny lady, very funny. And Gary Lavini, the violinist, uh, brilliant violinist, um, and myself. And we did all the routines, as I say, which Faye taught the girls. The And I remember Faye coming to the house to tell Dougie what the routines were, and she started doing them. And they were so fast. I mean, one routine was called Vitality. And she stood up, did Faye, and she said, it was vitality, da 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 da. And I said, Faye, that's so fast. She said, that's the, that's, the, that's the speed. They have to do the routines because of the kicks. They, if they do it any slower, they won't do the kicks. Hmm. And so they did it. And that was just one of the many, I did Razzle Dazzle em with the girls I remember doing. And, uh, but these girls were terrific and they were all tall and leggy and, we had some wonderful costumes made for them in the style of the original Tiller Girl style. Um, and it was a lovely, lovely show. And we did that show for two years. I think the first year was 20, 2000 and the second year was 2001. And I think the second year, I don't think Lizzie did it. I think Stu came in, Stu Francis came in and did it. Uh, for the second year but it was still Palladium Nights with Danny LaRue and in between doing the seasons at the Winter Gardens every Sunday uh, Dougie booked a minibus and we all went out doing a Sunday concerts to various outlaying places we went up to uh, Billingham uh, to the Forum and oh, all over the place doing Sunday concerts with the whole troupe the Tiller Girls all Danny's costumes Annie you know, uh, Danny's uh, lady, you know, right-hand man, we used to call her. And um, and I think another act was with us at that time called Sapphire, Stuart Laughlin and his lady, Jane. Um, and we did all these dates. We did a lot of dates in Scotland, I remember doing with Danny. And as I say, Dougie hired this minibus with a driver and off we went and did it. Sunday concerts, came back and I remember... We used to get back in the early hours of the morning. Some mornings was like two o'clock. And these girls, these Tiller girls, we either dropped them off en route wherever they'd left their car, or if they came back to Blackpool, somebody met them to take them home. But Danny arranged for the night watchman. Who else would get away with this? Danny arranged for the night watchman. We had his number, mobile number, at the Winter Gardens. Uh, and, and once we were on the M55... 
uh, one of us would ring this guy, I've forgotten his name, and say, right, we're on the M55, we'll be there in about 20 minutes, and he'd be there at the stage door to open up for us with a dress rail, for us to put all the costumes on this dress rail, otherwise we had to take them with us, you know. Mm. And we said, well, we can't do that, there's too many of them, there are lots of costumes. And wigs, you know what Danny's like, wigs, mm. boxes of jewellery, you know, everything. So this night watchman, bless him, would be there at the door with a dress rail and we'd get all this stuff in and we'd take it to one of the dressing rooms and lock the door, make sure everything was secure uh, until the next performance at the Winter Gardens. But how would you get to do that now, these days? Amazing, when you think back. So they were, they were great days. And also Dougie put on shows, variety shows at the North Pier a lot. Uh, with with stars like Alan Randall and Susan Morn, I remember. Uh, Alan was lovely with all the instruments and the ukulele and do, do, doing the George George Formby stuff. Again, Frank was in the show there. Um, Neville King, ventriloquist. Do you remember Neville King? Yes, I do. With the old man? Yes. Lovely man. Um, very good act. Uh, and as I say, Susan Morn, who was lovely. Bobby's girl. Um, so yeah, I mean, as I say, and I mean, even before I did pantomimes with for Dougie, Dougie established him, himself as a pantomime promoter, um, aged about thirty-three. That was his, um, nineteen sixty-nine, and he did his first pantomime again at Barnsley Civic. That's where he started with his pantomimes, and he did he did his first pantomime, Cinderella, starring Ken Platt and Brian Johnson. And Dougie was in it as Dame. And Jean Barrington, his partner at the time, was the principal boy. And the girl playing Cinderella was someone called Donna Douglas. I have got all the bills, but I, I, I couldn't get them all out for you um, to show you. But I've written these names down here. Um, Dougie was Dame. Ken Platt was comedian, as I say. Brian Johnson would have been the Baron Hardup. And Jean, of course, would be um, Prince. Donna Donna Douglas, who I don't know who she was, she played Cinderella. And then the second year he was there, 1771, he did Red Riding Hood there with Clinton Ford. And Dougie again was in it as, as a dame. Because uh, Dougie was a, a very good established dame in his younger days. Um, very good. Um, but as time went on, as I say, it's hard work. So I think he decided to let someone else do it. Um, and in this production of Red Riding Hood, do you remember the film Kes? You know the boy who had the um, the uh, hawk, what was it, hawk, hawk or something? Um, uh, the Kestrel. Kestrel. Kestrel, that was what I was thinking of. Uh, Kes. Uh, David Bradley was the boy, a Yorkshire lad. Mm. And uh, this was before he, he got the, f the film, I think. Or would it have been after, because Dougie booked him, I'm not quite sure, but anyway... He was in it, and uh, David Bradley, and uh, <laughs> Dougie always told me, because I, I didn't know Dougie at this time, Dougie said he used to come on and say to Cinderella, hey up love, because <laughs> he, was, he was Yorkshire, hey up love, out to doing, <laughs> he'd, say, he'd say to Cinderella, instead of, oh Cinderella, you look lovely or something, hey up love, out to doing, he'd say. Oh dear, that was David Bradley. Oh, and Ken Goodwin was in that as well, that production. Then the following year, 72, um, Dougie again did Aladdin. And in that was a comedian called Bobby Bennett. Do you remember yes. Bobby Bennett? Yes. Lovely comedian who eventually uh, played Dame for Dougie in later years. Lovely Dame, very sympathetic. He lives down on the south coast now. He moved from the north. So this was Aladdin, Bobby Bennett, Valentine Dial. Do you remember Valentine Dial, the actor? Yes. He played Abenaza in this pantomime. Dougie again was Dame. Jean again was Aladdin. And the Chinese policemen were Paul and Barry Harmon, mm. who were, of the, course, the, the Chuckle, Chuckle Brothers. Brothers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they also appeared in some of Dougie's early music hall shows. Uh, Paul and Barry, uh, who of course are the two brothers of Jimmy and Brian Patton, but they but then Paul and Barry got as the Chuckle Brothers, and uh, Jimmy and Brian worked themselves, you know, as the Patton Brothers. 
but they were originally the four of them but yeah that was Paul and Barry Harmon they played Chinese policemen in that then there was a year out I don't know what happened there there was a year out but then the following year 73 is the year I, I met Dougie and start I went into Barnsley uh, as, as I've told you earlier in this conversation in Jack and the Beanstalk but um, so Dougie has a long history of pantomimes as you can see and uh, as I say oh and then also I've got another page here Hayden <laughs> I've all uh, you're the most prepared guest I've had I'll <laughs> say that for you well, I couldn't I couldn't remember a lot of it so it's a matter of having to as I say I'd forgotten a lot of this it's done some good for me probably yeah so besides the Barnsley pantomimes that Dougie was doing he had um Scunthorpe Civic, 1975-76, a production of Goldilocks. Now, Goldilocks is a lovely pantomime. It's not done very often, but Dougie's script is lovely. It's a circus show, and it's about two rival uh, ringmasters, uh, the goody and the baddies. Uh, and we have a wonderful script of Goldilocks. It, it was one of Dougie's favourite pantomimes, if not the favourite. It's a lovely storyline. Dougie was always very keen for a strong storyline in a pantomime, which nowadays, he always did, but nowadays the storylines can get a bit lost, particularly with the bigger pantomimes because it's the stars who were there and they do their own bits. And um, But Dougie was always keen. It's got to be a strong storyline with lots of gags in but the storyline was always very important. Traditional pantomime, which, as I say, nowadays, sometimes it gets a bit lost. But this was a production of Goldilocks at Scunthorpe Civic. And uh, then after, uh, also during this period, 1976-77, Aladdin at the Charter Theatre Preston. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this one, but this was, yes, I have, because it's Frank Carson and, and Roy Barraclough myself so I've mentioned that 1977-78 Mother Goose this is a pantomime Dougie didn't do very often but I remember it um, and I did do it for him once and I think we did it at Cone at the Municipal Hall and I played boy then um, as opposed to girl um, and it is a nice pantomime but it's not one of the the ones that, you know, what, what we call the main ones, like your Cinderella, Aladdin, Dick Whittington's, you know, that. But it's nice pantomime. And we did that at Scunthorpe Civic. George Raymond was dame in that, who I mentioned earlier, who I knew, um, you know, from the days of uh, Nelson Firth and Aubrey. And also, I've got here, 1993-94, Dick Whittington at Doncaster Civic with uh, Dougie Brown. Do you, have you had Dougie Brown on one of your no, shows? No, but we're waiting for COVID to get a bit yeah. better. And then and the, be oh, lovely man. And great pantomime person, you know, great pantomime person. And again, I think he would, at this point, I think he would be principal comic. But in later pantomimes for Dougie, he did play, he has been playing Dame. But I think at this point he was probably comic uh, in uh, Dick Whittington. So he would be, um, he would be... Uh, Dick Whittington, he would be Idle Jack. 94-95, Dougie Brown again as in Cinderella at Doncaster. Doncaster, because he's local. He's, you know, he's, he's that area. Um, so that was the subject with Cinderella. So again, there, I reckon he would be Buttons. Then 98-99, again, Goldilocks at Southport Theatre this time. Now, this is Southport Theatre when it was the, the old Southport Theatre theatre not the new thing now um again that was goldilocks and then we did and um, the same year as well as doing goldilocks at southport theatre the same year dougie was doing dick whittington at the floral pavilion at new brighton so you see he had three or four pan big pantomimes going on at the same time you know and um there was a period where i lost my dad first and then I lost my mum and so I, I stopped singing a bit and began to work more beside Dougie in the production and uh, uh, directing side of pantomimes which I actually uh, enjoyed but I loved directing uh, and even now with the shows which I'm carrying on now in Dougie's name with the, the two little um, 
trademark shows I do, we'll meet again and good old days. I love directing. I, I love telling people <laughs> where to where to go and what to do. It sounds awful, isn't it? But uh, but I, I did do that. And it, so I worked alongside Dougie. I, I was really the gopher. Dougie was the desk man, the booker, getting all the jobs in. And I was the gopher. And so I ended up being in charge of the costume department, packing costumes, making sure the fittings were right, going and fitting and having alterations made, stuff like that. But still, working alongside Dougie, you know, you, you pick up bits and bobs. And as I say, when, when Dougie died, sadly, in 2017, I didn't know whether I was going to carry on with the business or not. And everyone convinced me that I should. And thankfully, I did. It took a little while to get into the swing of things. But uh, up to COVID, we were doing very well with it uh, and we're hoping that it's going to pick up again as I've been saying to you when we we start again uh, in the next couple of weeks once things uh, settle down but um, yeah so as I say working alongside Dougie um, you, you do pick up a lot I, I mean the business was his life you know he'd had uh, 50 odd years in show business from starting out as a lad uh, he, when he was at school, early days, he had a, uh, a troop of kids called the Dead End Kids. And they used to do little concert parties. And, you know, be, what would it be then? I don't know. In the, in the early days, it'd be a few, few quid, a few pence probably, wouldn't it uh, be? Um, but, uh, yeah, he had the Dead End Kids and they just did little comedy things. Again, which he put on and they got a bit of pocket money from it I suppose and then he used to go to all the theatres um, in Burnley where he was born his grandma used to take him to watch the turns they were called the turns and that's where his interest uh, grew from wanting to become the impresario the promoter that he eventually was and and was well recognised uh, throughout the UK you know everyone knew of Dougie Chapman so how did you both get together? Well, as I say, I first met him in 1973 uh, when I was in Bridlington, uh, as I say, I said, uh, doing this uh, summer thing for Edwin Harper, mm. and he was at the Spa Theatre with his variety show. I can't remember who was in it. I, I never saw his show. I just remember thinking, oh, Dougie Chapman, I know of him. He does pantomimes at Barnsley, and I was living it with my mum and dad at Barnsley, and I thought, oh, I'll see if I can audition, and da-da-da. And I was just starting out in the business, you know. And so I went and auditioned for him. So that's really when I first met him. And that's when he had the big sideboards, you know, that you can see on one of the photographs there. And uh, still a very big man. And uh, I auditioned for him, and, and as I say, he said, well, all I've got is fairy at Barnsley, if you want to do that, you know. In, in Jack and the Beanstalk so so that's really how I first met him but how did the relationship start well I suppose through me working with him or for him you know because uh, as I say for, I went from pantomime to summer show to pantomime to summer show and I suppose we took a liking to each other as they say and um, we got on well we worked well together and uh, it, it just it just developed from there really um, we never got married. We were just partners for 40 odd years. So, um, yeah, it was a good relationship. We worked well together. As I say, um, he, he was always the desk man and uh, did all the bookings and that. Obviously, that was the best way around because everyone knew him. And so, as I say, I, I, when I was singing, that was good. I, I worked in the shows and I looked after the shows, things like that. And then the period when I wasn't singing, I, I was working in other ways. And that's how I learnt the production, directing, promoting. I do all the promoting now. You know, I, I'd get all the printing done, which is what Dougie used to do. Uh, so I, I get all that done as well. So you, you have to be able to do a bit of everything, don't you? And it just developed from there. It was such a lovely relationship you both had. It was. It was. So Never memories. a dull moment. Mm.
never a dull moment there was always something and and I've been very lucky to have been involved in his life and go to the all the places like I said when we went to Connecticut you know to America to do those and and when I went on the cruise ships and stuff like that and and travel I mean we've been to some wonderful places in in this country with the shows so I've been very lucky that when I left college after training classically and came out of college I went straight into the business really meeting Dougie so I've really been in the business all my life you know some of the proudest moments as well I can see up on the wall there Dougie receiving his MBE that was a wonderful experience and it was it was a great honour and I remember when Dougie got the envelope uh, about it uh, saying you have been chosen da 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 um, and he said, but we haven't to tell anybody. Well, Dougie was not the best at keeping a secret. And uh, anyway, I said, now you mustn't tell anybody because you, ha you do have to keep it quiet for so many weeks. I said, and if, you, if anyone know, finds out, I'll know who's told them. I kept saying to him. <laughs> so anyway, uh, eventually we were able to tell, announce it. Mm. And we got the invitation to go to Buckingham Palace. And... Um, we didn't know up to a couple of days beforehand who was going to present him with the MBE. We thought at first it was going to be the Queen, but it ended up being Prince Charles. And Dougie was, I mean, he would have loved the Queen to have given him his MBE, of course, but it was nice that Prince Charles did because Prince Charles had a connection with the Grand Order of Water Rats. Uh, is a companion rat. I think I'm right in saying that. Somebody will correct me if I'm not. And uh, so he was pleased. And in fact, when we went to Buckingham Palace and uh, you, you walk in uh, and then you eventually have to split up. He went one way uh, to be told what to do and what not to do. And I went the other way into the room. And a man met me and said, hello, I, I, are you with a party? And I said, no, it's just me. <laughs> and I was lucky because he, he he walked me right down the centre and I was about three rows from the front, just in from the aisle. So I had a great view of everything that was going on. And in the uh, bandstand at the back, there was the musicians, one of the bands were playing lovely, you know, uh, underscore music, which was lovely as people were coming in. And um, so Dougie went one way, I went the other and sat down. And I, I learnt this later that... Um, they'd all been told that when they're announced they walk forward and they they bow they don't walk immediately to the to the prince charles or whatever they walk forward they bow and then they have to walk forward to the person bow again take the medal discuss or whatever back up bow again and walk off right so they'd all been told this so when it was Dougie's time to come and they announced him, Dougie Chapman, for service, uh, MBE for services, to outstanding services to charities and variety. So he walks forward and he does the bit, bows, and walks towards Prince Charles. And you know, Hayden, it seemed ages they were in conversation. But it was lovely because apparently Dougie told me later that uh, Prince Charles was talking about the goons. And, you know, crazy gang and stuff like that because he was into all that. And so it did seem, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't. It must have only been perhaps three or four minutes, but it seemed a lot longer. <laughs> you know, it was wonderful, really. But then, of course, when they'd finished the the conversation, and it's all so meticulous, uh, when when they're given their MBs or their, their medals or whatever, the uh, right-hand man comes up to whoever's presenting it, in this case, Prince Charles. So his man comes forward and Prince Charles never even looked at the medal. The hand just goes out, gets the medal off the off the cushion, pins it on, right, uh, that's it. The man walks back. Uh, and um, But then Dougie, who has been told then to bow, just nod, you know, just a nod of the head, back up before walking off. Dougie just turned round and walked off. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, off with his head. <laughs> So when, when he'd finished and um, it, we met up afterwards, I said, what are you like? You didn't nod and back up. He said, I know, I realised afterwards. I said, well, I thought, oh my goodness, you were the only one not to do that. 
I'm sure, well, I, I don't think anyone else would have noticed, but I said, you can't take, you can't take direction, can you? <laughs> you said then, um, when you sort of got the letter through and you said, you're not to tell anybody, did you used to boss him around a bit? Did you wear the trousers? Did I boss him around? Mm. Um, did you I, keep on the straight and narrow? You know? No, I don't think I boss anyone around. <laughs> some of my some of my artists, well, particularly my my boys, who I laughingly call my boys in my in my good old days, and we'll meet again. They'll say I boss them around. Um, I usually send out a warning. Uh, the, uh, there's a barrel warning out. Uh, but. Um, no, I don't think I bust him around. We were pretty amiable, you know. We mm. we discussed things, and I mean, he always really knew best about the business because he'd been in the business longer than me, obviously. But no, I don't think so. I don't think I bust him around, or he him bust me around. We we came to a amicable agreement. It was a mutual, yeah. Was a mutual, yeah we 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 were okay. We fell out like any couples do. Fell out, and that was it. You know, finished <laughs> over, done with. Um, but no, I think we were okay most most of the time. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. The other thing I see as well right in front of me is his inclusion on the comedy carpet, which is one yes. of my favourite places in the world. Yes. Um, what an honour. Again, it was lovely. And, and we didn't really know about it until again, he, I think he got a letter saying. And uh, we, he was absolutely chuffed to bits that he'd been included in it. And that photograph you're looking at now is, that was a couple of years before he died when he was failing. And um, we're very lucky here because we've got great access with public transport without taking a car. And it was a lovely sunny day. And I said to Dougie on that day, let's get on a tram and have a tram ride to the comedy carpet. I mean, it's not far, but he was struggling a little bit with his walking. Oh, I don't want to do that, he said. I said, oh, come on, it's a nice day, do you good. So I got him to, come and we watch we only need to walk round the corner and we've got a tram stop on the promenade here at Harrow Place so we got on the tram got off at Tower and of course when he walked up uh, to the carpet where he's on this first set that his name under Chaplin <laughs> Charlie Chaplin Dougie Clark I think Dougie Clark's on there uh, and all that and uh, he was absolutely thrilled to bits and so um, that photograph was taken then and from there, we walked up to the beach. There's a beach bistro just at the other side of the comedy carpet. So I said, I thought I'll keep him walking a bit while while we're at it. That's probably the only time I used to maybe boss him about a bit to keep him moving. <laughs> um, so we, we sauntered up to the beach bistro and we were able to sit there and have a glass of wine. And that's where I've got another photograph somewhere. I don't think I've got it on display. But I've got a nice photograph of him sat having a, 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 a tipple of red wine uh, on that same day. But yes, it, it was he was thrilled to bits that his name had been included on that comedy carpet. Some great names on there. Is there anything you wish you'd done differently? In what way? In, in your career? I don't know. I don't think so, because I've, I've worked all through from, as I say, going from school to college, to the guild hall, you know, classically trained. Um, I suppose in a way, if I'd have persevered, I, I might have gone into opera. But there again, there's a lot of, you know, you have a lot of stamina in opera as well. I think variety is easier than going into opera. You know, you, you imagine learning a full opera and, and the strain on, on the vocals and, and everything else. So I think possibly going into variety was a slightly easier option than going into opera. But there, there again, if I'd have gone into opera, I wouldn't have met Dougie, would I? I mean, I met Dougie through coming into variety, mm. if you understand my meaning. And, um, and I, I've been very lucky. I've worked all through. How did you look after yourself? Obviously, there was lots of strains on the voices in, in yeah. pantomime. Winter time, yeah. viruses, colds, flu. Yeah, I don't know, Hayden. I mean, you just do it. I mean, we always said in the, produ in the pantomime productions in the winter, if anyone gets a cold, you must protect, you know, you know, everyone else because obviously, if one goes down, everyone goes down, which is what happened in some pantomimes uh, when COVID first came out. You know, um, if if someone gets a cold, it spreads. It's inevitable. 
So we used to say, you know, just take some precaution, you like Sanderson's throat specific, which is a the standard thing, isn't it? You know, but if, if you feel a cold coming on, Sanderson straight away. It's no good taking it after you've got the cold, take it before you, you know you've got the cold. Um, but no, I think you, you just get on with it. You try and eat sensibly if you can. I think nowadays people are probably more uh, thinking about that than they were early days. I think early days, you just got on and did it. And f as far as I'm concerned, vocally, I don't know. I, I did do a warble now and again to warm up, you know, but I can't say I did a hectic exercise regime or anything like that. Um, so no, I, it, we just did it. It's, it's totally different now, I think. In the old days, you got away with a lot, didn't you? I mean, look at health and safety now. I mean, in olden days, we could throw slapstick, we could throw water in the audience, you know, on, with watering pistols, we could throw uh, sweets in the audience, you know, the old gags, mm. uh, all that. Can't do any of that anymore. Can't, you can't squirt water in an audience now because if it hits someone in the ear and they've got an ear aid in, you know, or you can't throw sweets out if it hits someone in the eye, you damage the eye. Um, you know, health and safety gone mad in a way. So again, we just did it. We, we, it was just a job, you know. I suppose I didn't really appreciate it at the time, to be honest with you, as much as I should have done. You know, go, again, going abroad and stuff like that. I, I, again, I just did it. It was work. Wasn't it was it? work, yeah, it was work. And I've, I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky both in my work and uh, my life in general. There's nobody really to fill the boots of Dougie. Um, there are no kind of entrepreneurs, there are no promoters like Dougie anymore, especially of that scale. There's, there's small scale people, but... Yeah, there's, there are some of the big ones, like look at Nick Thomas, head of Kudos. Now, he'll kill me if he hears me say this, although I have put something on Facebook. Uh, Nick did a, a pantomime for Dougie when, when Nick was doing the puppets. Nick Thomas... Uh, uh, topper, pu topper Puppets, I think it's called. Um, Nick Thomas is a very successful promoter, uh, you know, with Kudos. Um, you know, so many pantomimes and, and quality pantomimes, really well done. Tony Piers also does a lot of very good pantomimes. Um, I'm struggling now. Um, yeah, uh, the Grand Theatre, they use UK Productions, which again is a good pantomime company production um i don't yeah i'm struggling now but what would your advice be then for any kind of up and coming or or want to be the next prom big promoters but i i don't know how i could advise them to be honest with you um it is it is different most definitely but there are different it, it's a different world now to, to when we did it so I, I don't know how I could say what you should or shouldn't do. Um, whatever whatever you do, and if it works, it's got to be the right way, hasn't it? Trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that you wish you hadn't done over your career? Anything I hadn't done? Wish, wish you hadn't done. Wish I hadn't done. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um... Or would have done differently. Or would have done differently. I don't think I. I don't think I. There is, to be honest with you, again because I was. I was lucky. I was always busy. Now, had I have not been busy, so if I hadn't have met Dougie, and I'd have been out of work, maybe then I would have, been doing other things and done din done things differently. You know, I may have ended up as a hairdresser or as a, uh, a teacher of singing or you know whatever which is what my initial intentions was as I told you earlier on um, so I can't I can't honestly think of anything that I would have done differently having met Dougie it's all boiled down to meeting Dougie hasn't it in the end of the it day has. <laughs> I wish I could have met him oh uh, I do too Hayden you'd have liked him yeah um, he got on with everybody everybody uh, he, he was just just a very normal down-to-earth person who, who did a good job and he had great great relationships with theatre managers uh, particularly at Skegness Embassy when Leslie Shepherd 
was the manager there. Uh, well, first, Leslie was at Great Yarmouth. That's where I first met Leslie. And, and then Leslie moved to Skegness, where he stayed for many years before retiring. Uh, but Dougie always had a great relationship with all the, the theatres, whether they were the little civics or the bigger ones. Uh, you know, I mean, at um, the Billing uh, at f the Forum at Billingham. Uh, great relationship with Derek Cooper there, who, who runs that. Um, and at the Lowther Pavilion here, which is our little theatre at Lytham, Dougie loved that little theatre. He always said, I'd love to be the theatre manager there. But at that time, I think he was getting too old. You know, uh, as soon as you mention how old you are, you know, they're looking for a younger people. But Dougie would often go down to the Lowther and sit and have a coffee and talk to all the, the troop, you know, the, the gang there. Uh, not like nothing better, so he he was he did get on with everybody really. I don't think I ever knew him fall out with anybody really. Well, this leads me on to my last question: your dream pantomime. So you can be in it, you can be in the stalls watching it, you can choose the production, the theatre, and the cast can be alive or dead, or a mixture. Yes. I think my favourite pantomime was Aladdin. And the reason for that, I think, is it's a magical pantomime. It sparkles. Everything about it sparkles in the cave and this boy looking for a lamp. Uh, a funny thing was, when we were doing the production at Barnsley, the manager there, John Simmons, um, who was a fabulous man, uh, looked, did well with the pantomimes there. I remember him putting an advert in the paper uh, boy lost in mine it was when we were doing Aladdin but instead of putting boy lost in cave he put boy lost in mine well it's a mining community mm. and everyone was buying this paper thinking there was a boy lost in a mine <laughs> but of course all they could read about was the production of Aladdin at the Panzer Civic Theatre I mean things like that but yeah Aladdin it's a magical pantomime and uh, I loved playing the title role of Aladdin and playing the title role, um, playing the princess role in Aladdin, Princess Lotus Blossom. Uh, so I would love to, would have been loved to have probably been able to play that role again, but I'd be quite happy to sit in an audience and see a production of it that maybe I directed. Of course. <laughs> Wearing the trousers. <laughs> uh, uh, with, my, with my notes, I'm famous for my notes. I've heard about your notes as well. <laughs> Who did you hear that from? Uh, I can't say. <laughs> I cannot say. Yeah. But I have heard. About yeah, the notes. my Beryl and her notes. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I think my favourite pantomime is Aladdin. And if you asked, if you'd have asked Dougie, his, he loved Goldilocks. And again, I think it was the fact that there was a circus element in it, uh, and it was full of fun. Uh, you know, can follow the band with the with the all the music and everything. And I think I think Goldilocks would have been his. So who would be in your cast with you? In Aladdin. Mm. I, well, if I was playing the title role, I would need a Princess Lotus Blossom, wouldn't I? I don't know it, who I would have had as a Princess Lotus Blossom. Chinese policeman, probably the Patton Brothers, who did the last production for us. Um, and if I was, yeah, if I was Aladdin, probably wishy-washy would either be Stu Francis, again, great wishy-washy, or, again, the last person we used as wishy-washy in the production of Aladdin we did at Port Sunlight was Danny Rogers, Ted Rogers' son. He played Aladdin that time, but he could be wishy-washy, and he's a lovely lad, and so much like his dad, so much like his dad. Lovely entertainer. Um, who else? Abenaza. Mervyn. Mervyn was a, Mervyn Francis was a very very strong baddie. He's now playing Dane most mostly now, but Mervyn was a very good baddie. So Abenaza, I think Mervyn would be nice as that. Um, I don't know who else. I can't think of who I would use as a Princess Lotus Blossom. Um, I don't know many girls singers these days, I have to tell you. And I'm, I'm trying to remember who we've used in the past. I can't remember any. But um, but yeah, that's that's the basics of it. And the venue, your favourite theatre? Has to be the Lowther Pavilion. Has to be, because of all the memories of it. 
um, and the memories that it still holds. Um, um, yeah, strong connections with the Lowther. Um, so it would have to be the um, Lowther Pavilion Theatre at Lytham St Towns. It's a lovely little theatre, just a nice size, 440 seats, lovely atmosphere, lovely gardens round, it's got everything going for it. And with the developments that, that are in progress there, it's going to be even better. And um, yeah, Lowther Pavilion. Well, Beryl, thank you so much for taking part. It's been a pleasure, Haycroft. Thank you.